All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making these complex critical care subjects easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. All right, you guys, it's been a while since I've done one of these lessons, but Considering we just finished up that really long 12 lead EKG series, I felt like it was fitting to do another critical care medication lesson on nitroglycerin. So let's start off like we normally do with a history and background. So nitroglycerin was actually first synthesized in 1846 by an Italian chemist named Asiano Sobrero. Soon after that, it was adopted as a powerful explosive by the one and only Alfred Nobel. So this is actually the future founder of the Nobel Peace Prize, and it was later developed into dynamite. Now, in 1878, following the discovery that amyl nitrate actually relieved chest pain, uh, there was a physician by the name of William Murrell who actually experimented with nitroglycerin to relieve chest pain and reduce blood pressure in patients. His work was then published in The Lancet in 1879, and ever since then, nitroglycerin has played an integral part in the treatment of chest pain. Now, nitroglycerin is classified as a nitrate vasodilator. And the way that it works is, like other nitrates, nitroglycerin is actually converted into nitric oxide by the body. This nitric oxide stimulates CGMP production, uh, most notably in smooth muscle cells, uh, as well as some other tissues. CGMP leads to the reuptake of calcium into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, as well as increased extracellular calcium and then opening of calcium-gated potassium channels. This ultimately causes dephosphorylation of myosin light chains in the smooth muscle, giving us relaxation of smooth muscle and blood vessels, and thus ultimately vasodilation. Now, nitroglycerin has an effect on arteries, veins, and vascular beds, but the effects that we see are actually primarily due to its venodilation. This venodilation leads to pooling of blood uh, and a reduction in preload, and thus the workload of the heart, which is the primary benefit of chest pain relief. Now, dilation of arteries does still take place, though, uh, aiding in chest pain relief, as well as this can reduce blood pressure as well. The vasodilation of coronary arteries also increases blood flow to the heart and thus perfusion there. And the nitroglycerin can also help to reduce and prevent vasospasm. All right, so what are our indications? Nitroglycerin's primary FDA-approved indication is for the relief of chest pain secondary to coronary artery disease. That said, we also often will use this for hypertensive urgency or emergency, like I just talked about preventing or the treatment of vasospasm, and this includes the coronary arteries. We can also use it for congestive heart failure, and this really works by reducing that preload. And we can use nitroglycerin therapy to help delay or prevent intubation in these heart failure patients, especially when we combine it with like positive pressure ventilation, diuretics, and inotropes that we can try to stave off possibly intubating those patients. We can also do an inhaled nebulizer of nitroglycerin for massive PE or a crashing patient with pulmonary hypertension. The inhaled nitro will be converted to nitric oxide locally in the pulmonary vasculature, causing local vasodilation, thus reducing the pulmonary vascular resistance, as well as improving VQ matching. Typically, we use inhaled nitric oxide or epoprostenol or velitri. That said, though, not all facilities have this available, and it takes time to set up, so IV nitroglycerin is widely available, it's cheap, uh, and we're able to set it up and nebulize it rapidly for a patient, uh, thus achieving pulmonary vasodilation in minutes, which isn't possible with some of these other therapies. Now, what about our contraindications? So, obviously, anyone with a known allergic reaction or sensitivity to this medication, as well as if they have a known history of increased intracranial pressure, patients with severe anemia, patients who are having a right-sided MI. So remember that the RV is preload dependent and thus the significant reduction of preload that we can get from nitro can actually lead to profound hypotension and cardiovascular collapse. Another contraindication is going to be if the patient is concurrently using PDE5 inhibitors uh, used to treat ED. So these are like your Viagra, Cialis, etc. This combination can also lead to pretty profound hypotension. And then finally, patients who are in circulatory failure or shock. 
Now, as far as our adverse effects, the ones that we see are primarily related to the vasodilatory effects of this medication. So we can see things like headache, dizziness, lightheadedness, uh, all this resulting from hypotension, which is another adverse effect, uh, nausea, vomiting, diaphoresis, weakness, again, all these things that you would think would be associated with that hypotension. All right, so let's get into talking about our dosing here. Let's start off with the common concentrations. So nitroglycerin comes in many different forms, from pills to paste to patches, etc. cetera. Um, but I'm really gonna focus primarily uh, on the ones that you're most often gonna see and use in the ICU. So first is gonna be our sublingual tablet. And this one is pretty standard, comes in a 0.4 milligram tablet. Now when we're talking about our intravenous infusion, there's three different typical concentrations that we find. Uh, it's actually in a glass bottle uh, that's mixed with D5. And these include either 25 milligrams and 250 mLs, giving us a 100 microgram per mL concentration. We can also see 50 milligrams and 250 mLs, giving us a 200 microgram per mL concentration. And then finally, we have 100 milligrams and 250 mLs, giving us a 400 microgram per mL concentration. As far as the actual dosing, so when we're talking sublingual dosing, uh, this is where we're using this for patients with chest pain uh, thought to be related to ischemia. Basically, they place that tablet under their tongue, let it dissolve, and they can actually have up to three doses, so one every three to five minutes. Now for our inhalation and nebulizer, there really isn't clear evidence on the proper dosing, but it seems like the most common dosing is five milligrams of nitroglycerin nebulized over 15 minutes. Now when it comes to our IV infusion, so our dose range is typically going to be anywhere from 5 to 200 micrograms per minute. That said, I have seen some places actually go up to as high as 400 micrograms per minute. We're typically going to start off anywhere from 5 to 25 micrograms per minute and then titrate by 5 to 25 micrograms per minute, again depending on your facility and your order set. Uh, and we can do this usually every 5 to 10 minutes. Most often when we're using this, we're, we're aiming to achieve the elimination of chest pain or some targeted blood pressure goal. That said, if you work in a cardiac surgery unit, you may also see this set as a minimum set rate for those immediate post-op cabbage patients, specifically those with the lima involvement. And this is to prevent the vasospasm of that lima and to keep it patent after surgery. In the cath lab, nitro is also used to prevent or reduce radial artery vasospasm when they're doing radial approaches too. All right, so let's talk about our pharmacokinetics. So this is actually pretty quick regardless of how the medication is taken, but I'm going to be talking about the intravenous route here. So here the onset is actually pretty immediate. Um, it has a pretty short half-life, just two to three minutes. So if anything happens and we need to cut this off, usually in just a, a few minutes, we have the effect of this medication pretty much gone. It has a very quick time to the maximum effect of whatever dose we're at, and in studies they've shown this to be right around two minutes. Nitroglycerin itself is mostly protein-bound, so about 60%, and this is metabolized by the liver uh, as well as other tissues, and then these metabolites are excreted in urine by the kidneys. As far as antidote goes, we really don't have any known antidote for nitroglycerin, but we can actually counter the effects of the vasodilation, which I'll talk about in just a second here. All right, so on to our nursing considerations. So first and foremost, for patients that we have that are receiving nitroglycerin, we want to make sure that we've got them on continuous monitoring of heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, and oxygen tats. Again, in the ICU, this is already in place, but again, just make sure that that stuff is, is hooked up and accurate, uh, and especially if you're, you're going to be using this medication outside the ICU in certain situations. Now, we've talked a lot about the hypotension that can result from this. Uh, like I said, this is the most common adverse effect that we see with nitroglycerin administration, uh, and it really can be quite profound. Uh, like I said, this is especially true, uh, as mentioned, if, we, if this is given to patients who have a RV infarct uh, or they're taking those PDE5 inhibitors. So the most important thing is if we're experiencing this, that we want to either slow down the infusion or even stop it potentially, depending how profound this is. Really, our best response is to give fluids. Remember, we've dropped their preload, so we want to replace that, that volume intravascularly. Uh, we can also do this through passive leg raises as well. Pressors are actually not recommended, and they can actually cause more issues by increasing afterload. So another thing to consider is pulmonary shunting. 
So like other intravenous vasodilators, we can see VQ mismatching uh, that can result from increased blood flow through the lungs, and this is especially true in patients that have abnormal lung functioning. So this can lead to the development of a pulmonary shunt, and the manifestation is a sudden onset of hypoxemia without any respiratory distress or really other obvious respiratory causes. Another thing to consider is bradycardia, and while rare, uh, we do see some incidences of rebound bradycardia that have been reported. Now, as far as the administration of nitroglycerin, that we can administer this via central line, but we can also do it through a peripheral IV as well. On the topic of this, uh, it's important to know about something that we call low sorb tubing. So nitroglycerin has actually been found to be absorbed by tubing that's made from PVC. And this is common with most of our IV tubing. So this can actually reduce the effective dose that's being delivered. And there was one study that showed that as much as a 40% reduction in the amount of delivered medication. And so this is important to remember because if you're just using regular tubing, uh, after giving nitro through that tubing, nothing else can be infused after due to the risk of interaction of the absorbed medication. That said, we do have a, a special tubing, uh, it's called low sorbing tubing, that uh, greatly reduces the amount of medication that's absorbed. A lot of times we're going to see this tubing denoted with a blue color to that tubing. Another thing to be aware of is tolerance, and after prolonged administration, so you know, generally 24 or 48 hours, patients can really begin to develop tolerance to this and require higher and higher doses. And then giving these larger and larger doses begin to be more at risk for an overdose, if you will, of this medication. Again, the primary thing that we would see is that profound hypotension. Um, but along with that, again, something else to consider here with our nursing considerations is increased intracranial pressure. And this profound vasodilation can also lead to increased cranial blood flow, which can then lead to increased intracranial pressure. This can begin to present itself as extreme headache, confusion, vertigo, dizziness. Patient can have nausea and vomiting as well as visual disturbances. That said, if the pressures continue to rise, this can actually lead to significant neuro effects, including respiratory and cardiac effects, leading up to seizures, coma, and even death. And then finally, the last consideration here is going to be met hemoglobinemia. And this is a, a rare consequence of nitrate overdose. And here, the treatment of this is going to be IV administration of methylene blue, 1 to 2 milligrams per kilogram. And then lastly, when it comes to any relevant lab studies, there's no labs that we do or check when it comes to the administration of this medication. So I hope that you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated, so thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that, as well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.